So Dan Numbacher is the executive director of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Before joining the staff, he was a professor of engineering practice at Purdue. Purdue plays football, it turns out. And, uh, and, and he's, uh, he's actually been boasting about that for a little while, so if you're with Ohio State, he has probably sought you out. Dan has had several careers, and I'm not gonna mention them all. Um, he is a, a longtime uh, friend here and uh, an engineer at the Marshall Space Flight Center and NASA headquarters. Uh, we've worked a lot together. You know, I consider him a, a, a great friend. And Dan, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you introduce your panel, but thank you for coming. Well, thank you, Chris. So much material and you left it alone. I'm impressed, thank you. Um, first of all, let's hear another round of applause for Deborah Barnhart. I, know, I don't know if she's still around or not. But that's the kind of enthusiasm that we all need to share and show everyone about what we do. Now, here's a challenge for you. I've actually seen versions of these outside the Grosvenor Metro stop on the red line in DC. So if they can do it there in Maryland, we can do it all other places. Uh, let me introduce the panel. Uh, first, we have Admiral Jim Ellis, uh, who is the chair of the User's Advisory Group for the National Space Council. Uh, Jim is a longtime Navy veteran uh, and uh, served this country extremely well, and we greatly appreciate what he's done in the past and particularly what he's doing now to, to gather input and help inform the National Space Council on some of the, some of the issues and work that needs to be accomplished. Uh, we also have Eileen Collins, former uh, shuttle commander and uh, one of our great shuttle astronauts and doing all kinds of great work. You see her out and about helping particularly the young women and, and other STEM activities. So uh, we really appreciate what Eileen's doing. She is part of the user's advisory group as well. And then Mary Lynn Dittmar from the Coalition of Deep Space Exploration. Mary Lynn has a long history uh, in strategy and helping space station and other things come to fruition and uh, Mary Lynn is also on the users advisory group and they will get a chance to to talk about things here in a minute um, I want to set the stage a little bit this is not going to be is not meant to be uh, you guys asking them questions uh, we've done this a couple of times uh, at the AIAA Space Forum and also at the International Astronautical Congress in Bremen a few weeks back. This is meant to be an input gathering session. Uh, they would like to hear from you as to what needs to be addressed, what some of the issues are, some of the concerns. Um, the idea is to gather input to be taken back to the National Space Council through the Users Advisory Group. Uh, Jim will give you a little bit of an overview of what the uh, of, of what this users advisory group is, how it works within the Space Council, uh, and then Eileen and Mary Lynn will give you a couple of things that they're working on, some of their focus as part of the users advisory group, what they're focused on these days, and then we're going to go to you guys for input. Now here's fair warning. Um, all the students, please raise your hand. Is the UNLV crowd here? Where, where are you guys from? I know we have UNLV, Maryland, UAH, University of Illinois. Are there any others? Okay. What up here? UCF. Okay. Excellent. So the students get first cut at providing input. So, and then I'm going to call an audible. Jim doesn't know I'm going to do this, but I'm going to call a little bit of an audible, and that is after the students. The mid-career folks get the next round of input. So just fair warning, so students, be ready, because after they get done talking, you go first. And if the UNLV crowd is here, I'm going to start with them because I think you probably came the farthest. So with that, I'll turn it over to Admiral Ellis. Jim, have at it. Thanks, Dan. Everybody hear me all right? If not, I can bellow louder. Okay. While they're uh, putting up my slides, if you would please, the, uh, the first group of, uh, there they are. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity for us to, uh, to join you in this, uh, in this great venue, uh, in, this, uh, in this wonderful symposium, the 11th, I guess, in a, 
in a, in a series. Uh, we're delighted to be a part of that. And, uh, and as Dan said, uh, we're here on, uh, as part of what we call, uh, in quotes, a listening tour, I guess. Um, are there any English majors in the house? I didn't think so. Oh, there is one. Good, good. Okay. All right, great. Yay. Well, by way of saying it all, if you look at the, uh, the title of, of this, the User's Advisory Group, it's S apostrophe. In other words, this advisory group belongs to everyone who is a user of space or aspires to be a user of space. Now clearly, as Dan hinted, that includes the, the high end, the primes, the new space, the startups, all of that, but it also includes uh, the students, it includes the, uh, uh, the mid and, uh, and uh, sub-tier, third-tier suppliers, it includes everyone who cares about space, is involved in space in any significant way. Our intent is to represent you. There are 28 of us on this group, uh, and so there's no way we could possibly represent all of the constituencies out there uh, on, the, uh, on the domestic space scene, and that wasn't the intent. But part of our uh, mission, after conversations with the chair of the National Space Council, uh, the vice president, is outreach. And we've defined that uh, fairly broadly. As, uh, as Dan indicated, we've been to Orlando at the AIA space event. We were at the IAC at Bremen, uh, interacting with the International uh, uh, Space Generation Advisory Council and, uh, and other international uh, partners and prospective partners. And we're certainly here today. And this is part of a continuing series that we're going to uh, we're going to be uh, continue to be embarked on for uh, uh, for the next uh, couple of years while we listen. Uh, and as I'll say at the end, we're looking for things that you think need to be addressed that aren't being addressed. Issues, ideas, concepts, and, uh, and if, you're, uh, if you're struggling right now and you can't come up with something, I'm going to give you a, uh, an email address at the end of this where you can send them in and, uh, and submit them, uh, whether they're white papers, whether they're just thoughts or questions, you can submit them to the user's advisory group. So without further ado, I'm going to click through these slides uh, administratively. First, I probably ought to start, for, for some of you that may not be as familiar with the, uh, the newly reconstituted National Space Council, it's, uh, uh, it's an advisory body chaired by the vice president consisting of a number of key cabinet officials. The Secretary of Defense is on it. The Secretary of Commerce is on it. Uh, also represented, obviously, is the NASA Administrator, the, uh, uh, the National Intelligence Director, uh, those types of, of high-level individuals. It existed actually only briefly in its history. It was chartered in, uh, in congressional language uh, in, from 1989 to 1993 with its, was its most recent incarnation, but it was reestablished last year uh, under the leadership of Vice President Pence. In, uh, in June of last year. And its objective is to coordinate U.S. national space policies across all relevant agencies. So it's not just NASA. NASA is an extremely important part of that, particularly on the exploration and, uh, and discovery side, the science piece. But, uh, but it includes all segments, the, uh, the civil space, the commercial space, the national security elements, and, uh, and international collaboration and cooperation. And obviously, the objective is to strengthen uh, uh, and continue U.S. leadership in space. Uh, they've met a number of times. The most recent was on uh, Tuesday of this week. That's why I arrived late for the, uh, for the conference. I, uh, I had a, a brief speaking part at, uh, at the most recent meeting. You can see where uh, the National Space Council is convened. It's live streamed. It usually uh, draws a lot of media attention. The vice president, as I indicated, chairs it. Uh, each of the cabinet secretaries that have been specifically tasked through uh, space policy directives that you see listed at the bottom are due, re report outs are due on how they're doing and what progress they're making in the, uh, in the remit that, uh, that the National Space Council Council uh, and the chairman have assigned them. Uh, the Users Advisory Council, uh, it's a federal advisory committee governed by, uh, by the FACA Act, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, uh, which means that most of our deliberations are going to be done in the, uh, in the public domain. They're going to be transparent and visible. Uh, the charter was signed uh, last year. Uh, and then our first meeting, after we were formally appointed in, uh, in June of, the, of this year, was, uh, was held on the 19th of June. Uh, we're intended to be uh, uh, the voice of all of you uh, to the White House National Space Council. And so uh, that's why we're here. Uh, we don't want to be our own voice. We have great representation, as you've heard, uh, uh, both in, uh, in Eileen and Mary Lynn of, of space uh, experts, but uh, we also acknowledge that there are a lot of other people out there that, uh, that have issues and concerns that need to be, uh, to be addressed. And we are tasked with advising the National Space Council on any and all space policy issues relevant to, uh, to all of you. 
Uh, we'll meet three or four times a year. Uh, we met, as I said, in June, and we'll meet again here uh, in, uh, in November. Uh, I don't expect you to read this, but uh, if you're wondering what our remit is and, uh, and how broad is our charter, uh, if it has anything to do with space, we can talk about it. Uh, we can hear about it, we can take input on it. Uh, it's not just uh, commercial or civil or exploration, it includes national security, it includes both human and robotic exploration priorities, uh, innovation and efficiencies, which are some of the things that, uh, uh, that our committees are specifically focused on, and then uh, strategies to increase uh, public, academic, and uh, commercial and international support for U.S. space policies and, uh, and programs. So again, if it's got anything to do with space, we're allowed to, uh, to address it and to comment on it and to advise the national Space Council. This is from our charter, a description of duties. Uh, again, I'm not going to, uh, to run through it. These are all, by the way, listed on the NASA website. We have a, a page there that's uh, detailed for the user's advisory group. And if you want to see what the charter looks like, you want to see the committee structure, you want to see who's on it, uh, all those things are, uh, are part of the, uh, the public domain. But uh, as I say, we're intended to, uh, uh, to ensure that all of your interests, everybody who's not a federal entity, uh, and other persons involved in aeronautical and space activities are represented before the National Space Council. We can do whatever uh, the Vice President wants us to do, whatever he assigns us to do. I once worked with a guy who was fond of saying, you know, what my boss is interested in absolutely fascinates me, you know. And so uh, if, the, uh, if the Vice President is interested in something, then uh, obviously we're going to take that on as, uh, as something to address. But more broadly, uh, we're, uh, we're casting a wide net to, uh, to get comments and thoughts and, and inputs from, uh, from all of you. We will submit an annual report to the Council on our activities. I was in front of the Council on, uh, on Tuesday giving them an update on what we've been doing and, uh, and what we're up to, uh, and that interaction will continue. We're organized in this manner. Uh, there are six subcommittees. Uh, these are drawn directly from the priorities that, uh, that I received from the Vice President in conversations with him last spring. Uh, we have an Exploration and Discovery Committee. That's uh, chaired by retired General Lester Lyles. Les is also the chairman of the NASA Advisory Council, as some of you uh, may know, which makes a nice Boolean overlap in a sense because he's seeing both the NASA piece and then the broader space issues uh, as, he, uh, as he serves on the uh, user's advisory group. We have a National Security Space Committee. I chair that one. Uh, that deals with the classified elements of, uh, of space. The, uh, the members of the committee are required to have the appropriate level of security clearances, and we're going to be uh, hearing from uh, Steve Gatte, as you will, here uh, shortly uh, in, our, uh, in our next committee meeting in, uh, in mid-November about uh, some of the classified elements of, uh, of space and, uh, and space policies. We have an economic development and industrial base Committee. Marilyn Dittmar to my right and Eric Stalmer, her colleague, uh, co-chair that uh, with the, uh, the obvious focus that, uh, that you can see in the, uh, in the space economy that we heard so much about in the conversations uh, yesterday. A technology and innovation panel uh, chaired by former astronaut Pam Melroy. Uh, an outreach and education panel, uh, Eileen Collins uh, to my left, uh, something she's passionate about. Uh, how we really deal with the educational challenges, the workforce challenges that are so much a part of Huntsville's focus uh, over these many years and indeed, indeed led to the creation of, uh, of UAH in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, those kinds of lessons uh, need to be applied more broadly if the nation is going to retain its leadership role in, uh, in this dynamic new space environment. And then uh, uh, finally, we have a, a space policy and international engagement element. Uh, David Wolf, also a former NASA astronaut, chairs that committee. It obviously, as you can see from his title, talks more broadly about space policies and, uh, and uh, norms of behavior and the, uh, and the, uh, the grander things that, uh, that we need to talk about in terms of international collaboration and cooperation going forward. So that's how we're structured. Uh, this is what we need from you. Uh, we need what a new partnership constructs, what could they look like? Uh, what are the areas of exploration and scientific research that, uh, that you don't think are being, uh, being appropriately addressed? Uh, what are the hurdles or the obstacles, bureaucratic or regulatory, that, uh, that need to be removed to facilitate and enable you to move more effectively and more importantly, just as importantly, more quickly to address the challenges that are ours in space? Uh, innovative technologies with potential space applications. 
this is your chance. Uh, if you've got something like that uh, uh, to uh, to short circuit the system in a sense and and get a direct input to the uh, uh, to the National Space Council, and then uh, we're just looking for big ideas, or actually, to be fair, ideas big and small uh, for advancing American leadership in space. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, we need inputs and ideas, uh, issues and innovations, and uh, if you. Uh, don't get a chance to get to a mic today and, uh, and send those or, or relay those to us. Uh, there's the, uh, uh, the email address that you can use. It's open for business as of last Friday. Uh, you can uh, uh, send your, uh, your input to that with an attachment if it's a white paper or, a, or a, something you want to, to get to higher level attention. Uh, there is a disclaimer there that, uh, that NASA has asked me to uh, make sure I put on here. Let's make sure you don't send anything as private or personal or classified or, uh, or proprietary because it's going to be open open to everyone, as are all of the del deliberations of the, uh, of the user's advisory group. So this is what the, uh, the National Space Council user's advisory group is, according to the vice president. Uh, but uh, I would uh, parse it a little bit more finely. Uh, the broad range of truly exceptional Americans doesn't refer just to the user's advisory group, or if it refers to the user's advisory group at all. It refers to all of you, uh, the generations of uh, professionals, uh, past, present, and future that, uh, that are in this room that are going to uh, continue to, uh, to pursue the, uh, the preeminence in space that's such an important part of, as we've heard over a couple of days here, not just our DNA, but our aspirations uh, uh, for the nation and for the world. So again, uh, with that, I'd, uh, I'd close with a, my favorite quote from Stephen Hawking, uh, look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. Be curious, and we are curious about what's on your mind. So with that, I'll pass it to Mary Lynn. For, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jim and Mary Lynn. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jim. Um, thank you to uh, AAS for inviting us to be here and to UAH for hosting us. It's always good to be back here. Um, for those of you that don't know, I was on the faculty here from 1989 to 1995. Um, the campus has changed so much, I barely recognize it. Um, it's great to see students here and great to see your involvement, and so thanks for being here. Um, as Jim mentioned, I co-chair the Economic Development and Industrial Base Subcommittee of the UAG. We have a very broad charter, as you can hear just from the words that make up that, that title. Um, what we did, I think what all the committees did, subcommittees did, was solicited input. Um, in the very first meeting of the UAG, uh, Jim was very eloquent in sort of calling to out to the public um, and to those people who were interested in industry to submit inputs. And also, members of the UAG were free to submit inputs to each other's committees. So we had crosstalk going on uh, in terms of, ex of exchanging information ideas about what topics we wanted to um, address. So we ended up with quite a list um, that essentially covered the entire economic development spectrum as well as the entire industrial base and a whole lot of things in between. And so each subcommittee is sort of self-organizing, right? It's, it's running according to how the chairs feel that they want to run the subcommittee. So Eric Stalmer and I got together. Eric's the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. Eric and I got together and sat down and tried to figure out how we wanted to run it. And what we did was we just took this entire list of topics that had been uh, delivered to us and parsed them out. Uh, you know, some of them probably don't really belong in the purview of a UAG. There were a couple of things that were very interesting, but probably um, we're going to make a couple of consultants really happy, whoever you are out there, by saying, no, this is really a consultancy um, sort of a, a question. Um, some other ones that really were just sort of outside of our wheelhouse, some others that we thought were great to get to, but probably not within the scope of trying to get something done in a couple of years, which is what the tenure of the UAG is. And so we ended up with um, four or five topics. And we just met with the complete subcommittee uh, last week um, and, and talked to them, did telecon, um, and talked to them. I mean, Tori is here. I mean, he was on the call. And, um, and, and many, many others of our subcommittee were on the call. And we ended up with the following list. And so what I want to do is just read you the list, uh, because what it does is it represents where we are right now. These are the, these are the 
uh, focus areas that we're going to try to address sometime in the next couple of years. Uh, we are right now having a discussion internal to the subcommittee about how we're going to prioritize these. So I am not reading them in order of priority as they have been determined by the subcommittee. I'm just providing you with a list, and this is just to give you an idea. Um, developing recommendations for accelerating the economic development of low Earth orbit, and that of course would include the questions surrounding the space station, the moon, and cislunar space. Developing a framework for understanding and applying different contracting mechanisms to include public-private partnerships, other transactional agreements, Space Act agreements, cost plus, et cetera. So right now in our area, our field, there's a lot of discussion, confusion, misunderstanding, uh, misinformation, straight thinking, depends on who it is that you're talking to at any given time, about when those vehicles are appropriate and when they're not, and we're gonna try and get our hands around that a little bit, if only to try to describe what the issues are that are associated with each one of them. How to manage the range of space-related spectrum issues. Um, this question definitely came to us from the White House, and that is an abbreviation of the actual question, which has uh, eight subcomponents to include things like spectrum sharing, um, uh, allocation, international relationships having to do with spectrum, et cetera. So there's a great many there. And that one is really cross-cutting. It's going to end up being, I think, in discussion with several of the subcommittees um, because it has implications for, for Jim's, uh, Jim's uh, subcommittee, has implications for Pam's subcommittee on technology and innovation. So that, one, that one's going to be cross, probably cross-cutting. Possibilities for the expansion of use, lease, and commercial space launch act agreements, especially when related to latent or mothballed infrastructure and excess capacity. Again, uh, a contracting and availability issue that has to do with how uh, private industry interacts with the federal government. Strengthening and expanding the overall U.S. space industrial base and infrastructure. And you already heard some discussion of this yesterday when we we're talking about workforce development, um, but also looking at infrastructure needs. We have a lot of aging infrastructure uh, in the country, some of which is probably available for use, uh, both for the government and and perhaps for private industry, we have some aging infrastructure we just don't need anymore. Um, and we have some infrastructure needs that may not be being met, and so we're gonna try to address those. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, what it is that we're gonna look at. Um, just to reiterate what, what Jim said, uh, to, I'm hoping that before we leave, you'll put that um, email address back up there, um, to get inputs uh, from you, from all of you, and then, of course, as we're sitting here, we can take some questions, so thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mary Lynn. Eileen? Yes, good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to say this is really an honor for me to have the opportunity to serve on the user advisory group and to uh, work with Admiral Ellis, who, who keeps telling me to call him Jim, but he's Admiral Ellis and, and Mary Lynn, and we just have such a fantastic group of uh, people, not just what they've accomplished, but what they still want to do and how much they care about the United States and our space program and the international uh, opportunities that we have. And we uh, work for the Vice President of the United States. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to do that and he is extremely interested in space and I think that we have this uh, kind of a narrow opportunity here. I know we've, uh, we have a, a two-year mission here, hopefully it will be extended, but I would like to see us do as much as we can in these first two years um, uh, because there is so much to be done. And I'd like to start with um, just a quick story about a couple of months ago, I was talking to an executive at a major bank and she's, one of her responsibilities is hiring employees for that bank. And we got to talking about the workforce and even banks have trouble finding qualified people for the skills that they need. And we got to talking about engineers, and she said to me, <clears throat> engineers, I'll hire an engineer in a minute. I go, really? I go, you're a bank? You'd hire an engineer? I go, why? And she said, engineers know how to solve problems. I go, yeah, that's true. And so, you know, I t had a discussion with her about you know, the, really the shortage of engineers that we have. Um, not just for engineering jobs, but having that kind of talent and the way engineers think, the way they design, the way they, they solve problems, can be used throughout the United States and other industries, not just uh, air and space. So, 
to jump ahead to uh, what we're doing on the Education and Outreach Committee, um, yes, it does include workforce, but if you can go back to how do we develop that workforce and with the situation in this country with, and I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna focus on engineers, but you know, it, it includes math and analysis and you know, statistics people, data people, we, you, you can go on and on. Some of these degrees are very difficult degrees for young people. And uh, I think it, we ought to just help them along. So I have three recommendations that, uh, you know, I'm not sure if we're gonna present these or not, so I'm here today because I wanna get your ideas, um, especially the students, you know, what do you think about these? Are these good recommendations? Um, are we a little bit off base? Uh, can we tweak them a little bit? Uh, and, if, and please, well, I'll be looking forward to your emails if you can't uh, uh, let your friends know also for the students here. So the first uh, recommendation that we're looking at um, has to do with incentivizing students while they're in high school or even in their early college years to choose engineering degrees. So a couple of examples. There's a program called the FAFSA, which I don't know if you're familiar with the, it's the Free Application for Student Aid, and it's a federal program, and all high school students know about it because it's, you apply and you get grant money from the federal government. And it is completely based on need. And there's other programs like Pell Grants, but, and that's a good program. Um, but it doesn't incentivize one degree over another or one area over another. So the question is, should it? I don't know, but could we make a recommendation that says maybe we could make more money available uh, to these students who qualify under the FAFSA program if they choose to study these certain degrees? So let us know what you think about that. The second one is retaining students in engineering. So just from the students I talked to and uh, People I know, it seems like there's a high dropout rate in engineering in colleges across the country. So I've done a little bit of research on this, and if you look at, there's an organization called College Transitions, and you know, obviously some colleges have lower dropout rates, others have higher, but if you look at it across the country, uh, and you add it all up, they say 60% of engineering students eventually drop out of their program or out of school, 60%. And they go on to say that 40% of them don't even make it through year one. They say that the primary reason for the students dropping out is lack of preparedness for the level of rigor that they need to study at in college, a lack of preparedness. So the problem goes a little bit deeper. Now, I'm not saying we should lower our standards. I absolutely do not think the standards should be lowered, but I think the students can be better prepared. So. My question for uh, the, peop the students here, and frankly, anyone here, is uh, number one, why is the dropout rate so high? I think you know, the work has been done on this, but a lot of it has been done in certain colleges. I'm not sure there's been anything done nationally. And then the second thing is, what can be done about it? Uh, you know, it and especially from the user advisory group's position, we're interested in space, obviously. So um, from those, those are two questions I'd like you to help us answer. And the third recommendation, it, well, we're calling it right now Space Education Contract Initiatives. So this one's a little bit different. And I think the best way to describe it is with an example. So some of you might be familiar with the NASA Design Challenge. Uh, it's been going on for about five years now, and it's one way NASA can outreach to universities, uh, students across the country to actually do uh, projects that are, you know, for example, actually going to fly in space. So if you go to the NASA website, you'll see under STEM education, you can click on that area, um, student, uh, university student design challenge. And this program so far has been very successful. In fact, what they're uh, doing this year, and some of you may actually be involved in it, there's uh, two of them. One of them is conceptually design an electronic regional jet. And the second one is uh, solar power exploration of Venus. And those are the two that w went out this year. There was one in 2014 that actually flew. It was a radiation experiment that flew on EFT-1. So, and there's other examples. Uh, one of them is uh, CubeSats. 
So uh, I read a statistic somewhere that said cube, that half of all CubeSats are either designed by students or uh, students have worked on them. Actually, uh, CubeSats in orbit right now. So NASA has done a very, very good job of reaching out to the students in through contracts uh, and other type of these initiatives. So the recommendation would be to ask other federal agencies to look at doing something similar to what NASA is doing. Uh, within the DOD for space, it would be primarily Air Force. Uh, you could look at NOAA, uh, possibly uh, the National Reconnaissance Office or uh, Missile Defense Agency. Some of these have security clearance requirements, but uh, that can be worked around. So that would be the third one that we're looking at. And again, you can let us know what you think about that, um, if you think these uh, programs could be extended. And we don't just do education, but we also do outreach. So my committee is, we outreach to the other committees, um, but what we're also doing is trying to organize these types of events. And we uh, are, some of the, this is outside of my committee right now, but I think, uh, the uh, most recent space policy directive, which is on space traffic, space traffic management, is something we'd also like to hear about. Um, there's a lot of orbital debris up there. There's, a, you know, really nobody's in charge of what's going on with the current uh, uh, orbital environment, and that's, I think, a big challenge for our country. So even though it's not within our committees, um, I think you were willing to hear about that or any of the other uh, items that Admiral Ellis had put up earlier. So. Um, Having said that, also let us know what we're missing. Uh, we want to hear your ideas. So thanks for being here, and I think I'll turn it back over to Dan. Yep. And we'll, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Eileen, uh, Mary Lynn, and Jim. Uh, that gives us a lot of food for thought, uh, and we have a good 45 minutes. Uh, for conversation and discussion. And what I'd like to do, uh, Admiral Ellis, Jim, I keep switching back and forth. I'm not consistent. Um, that's a bad thing. The, what, he's opened up the trade space, so to speak, and we, have, uh, we can talk about anything uh, that's space related. Uh, Eileen and Mary Lynn have given us specific questions and, and areas of thought uh, to possibly address. But first, I'm going to open it up to this student section I see kind of right in here uh, and let you guys kind of carry the converse, start the conversation off uh, and go from there. So, uh, Jim, I think we have one right here. Hi, I'm Valerie Ludensky. I go to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And in terms of the dropping out, not finishing, um, I'm, I'm sort of the opposite. I came from psychology and entered into engineering, but Yay. I've... Oh. You have one right here. You have a cohort. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Something I've noticed, though, is a big issue is that we're really test-oriented for a group of people who we end up only working on projects. I mean, everyone I know who has a GPA that doesn't look that great or had to retake classes, it's because outside of classes, they will find their projects. They'll work on them anyway, but it doesn't count for anything and then their test scores are lower because there's testing anxiety, there's not a focus on memorizing these things. It's just not what we see our future being. And this is predominantly for people who will survive that first year and go on and try to finish from there, but I, I really think the testing focus is a major issue. It's just not what we do. Yeah, that's a great input. Thank you, I wrote that down. And you know, I think, I, I agree with you. I think we can be testing too much. I'm going to tell you, when I went through astronaut training, there was no testing. But by the time I left the astronaut office, they had started testing the uh, new class of astronauts. And uh, I, I've gotten mixed feelings on that, too, because I think when you don't have the pressure of testing, you're going to focus on, you know, what's, you know, what's really important and why am I here. So I thank you for that input. Hello. My name is Avery Moore from the University of Illinois. And uh, talking to Eileen Collins about um, retaining students in engineering as well, I think that some of the most meaningful and influential conversations I've had are with 
uh, people from industry coming back and telling me about how their education went and the struggles that they had and how they were able to overcome that. I think that's been some of the most influential things in you know my student career. And I think that when what uh, Dan talked about earlier about mentoring is just very crucial. I think also in schools, you know, reaching out to the programs and letting students know that, you know you had failures, you had to learn, and like what you did to overcome that. That's some very valuable information for us. So. Okay, thank you. I know that there are mentoring programs uh, throughout the, you know, the industry and throughout universities, and they're, it's good to hear your feedback on that. Thank you. Um, I'm Kimberly Gonzalez. I'm from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I think for me, like the biggest challenge was um, the difference in teaching styles from high school and college. Um, it's it's just it's a big difference. I don't know how to explain it, but um, I tutor, and I was actually I, I worked in a in a tutoring center, and they taught me how to tutor in order um, for the students to learn better. And, um, I remember I was talking to one of my professors and he was saying, oh yeah, they want engineering professors to take education classes to, uh, learn how to teach better. And I think that's a bad idea. I'm like, no, you guys don't know how to teach. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I've lived that one. <laughs> you know, I, I actually think that's a very good input. I, I, I am a former college calculus teacher, and the place I taught at made us have applications in the classroom, and they made us sit in on each other's, the professors sat in on each other's classes, and we had several other requirements on us, which, uh, including doing research, which is something college professors spend a lot of time on, so I think that's a very good uh, input. Thank you. I wrote that down. Way up here to your right. Hi, uh, my name is Wesley Chambers. I'm a graduate student at the University of Central Florida uh, in physics. And as a response to the comment just about whether or not um, STEM should be emphasized, I think that is, uh, it's really important. My only concern would be that that not be to the expense of other uh, disciplines insofar as I was a history major that moved into physics. Um, and I've found that uh, the skill sets, whether it's logic or writing, all of those things are incredibly important, even in what I'm doing now. Um, in fact, one of the best professors I had as an undergrad uh, was philosophy and physics. So, uh, any case, those are important skill sets. I think that are important even for those of us who are in science and engineering. Yeah, I, if yes. if I may, Eileen, uh, I think that's a that's a great point. I mean, we're we're part of something bigger. Uh, the reason we're attracted to space, most of us in this room, is because of it's bigger than we are. It's something that uh, that carries that that cachet, that sense of, uh, of urgency and opportunity, and that's why you increasingly hear, though it's some folks don't like it, the term STEAM instead of STEM, where they've added the A for arts to uh, to include uh, some of the uh, the elements that uh, that you describe, and I and I think that's true. And I also would like to. Uh, uh, to resonate with you on the uh, on the writing piece, because uh, you can be brilliant, but if you can't express your ideas in uh, in coherent and understandable ways, uh, you're not going to be quite as effective. No matter what field you find yourself in, including engineering, and so so I would uh, I'd say those are those are a couple of uh, great points, and uh, and also we uh, we'll take that aboard. Thanks. Hello, so I'm um, Quinn Kupek from the University of Maryland. Um, Colonel Collins, you talked a little bit about uh, the dropout rate within the first two years. So we actually have a really interesting program at Maryland, which is a living learning program for engineers, uh, and it runs for your first two years um, because the research shows that that's when you're most likely to drop out of engineering. Uh, and they've seen students who go through that program, the retention rates are way up um, because it builds a community. So you live with all other engineers your first year. Uh, the living portion is optional the second year, but you also take a class once a week together um, to work on like career building and course preparedness, help you adapt to taking these much harder courses than you were taking in high school. Uh, and that's actually funded through the NSF, so it'd be interesting if we could get grant money out uh, to other schools to perhaps adopt a similar program. Okay, so if, if we may take one more from the students, and then I want to go to the mid-career and start expanding right. this discussion a little bit. I've got one. 
So uh, I am Alex and I'm currently a graduate student here at UAH, but I'm speaking to my uh, undergraduate experience at University of Florida. So I agree that there's a big difference between the demands placed on us as high school students versus what we get when we're in college. So all the college stuff is good, but perhaps we need to demand more of the high schools to bridge that gap. And also, um, motivating staying an engineer the first year or so, you're not really taking engineering classes. You're taking all the prerequisites, the calculus, the chemistry, the physics. So there are lots of tests in that. And, but at the same time, I feel like we're getting bombarded with a lot of stuff that we're having difficulty really seeing relevant as to the end goal. So then we go off and do other things before we actually get to really experience any engineering. Oh, anybody? I think that's that's a, a great point too, and and how do you let folks know what's coming in advance? Now you obviously need the prerequisites, but perhaps earlier involvement in uh, in some project course or something that kind of gives you a hint of what's to come might uh, might keep you going through those uh, those more difficult uh, and structured prereqs. But I also think uh, uh, that that's uh, that's part of the uh, the exploration effort. Go ahead, Eileen. Yeah, I, you know, I just wanted to add to that. Uh, some students have told me that their first year, that, that mainly they talk about chemistry and physics. Now, these are engineering students, and they'll say my physics course was with physics majors or my chemistry course was with chemistry majors, and why can't my college have, like, a chemistry course for engineering majors? So I don't know if that makes sense, and maybe some colleges do and some don't, but I think that might, yeah. So that, well, that probably uh, would be helpful. Okay, so if we can expand this a little bit, uh, maybe to the mid-career and beyond, uh, and uh, I'll just say it that way. <laughs> I think Wayne Hill wanted to know if he was mid-career, Dan. Do you, do you think Wayne Hill is? <laughs> By an interesting definition, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good morning. I'm Joan Wadiska with the National Conference of State Legislatures. I represent the nation's uh, state legislators and state legislative staff. Um, I find this conversation incredibly compelling. Uh, since the Great Recession, two-thirds of all new jobs require advanced or medium digital literacy skills, and 56% of all new jobs since the Great Recession are in STEM-related fields. And yet, America last year only graduated 50,000 students with computer science preparation for more than 570,000 job openings in computer science alone. What we like to say at NCSL is what is good for space is good for states, and it's good for the American people. And we know that the skill sets that are needed to put humans back to the moon, deep side of the moon into Mars, are the same skill sets that are needed to advance our economy. And so we would be happy to work with you um, to highlight what are effective best practices to accelerate and provide a human capital pipeline that can accomplish all these missions. Thank you very much for that. I yeah, thank you. And we had an er earlier conversation over coffee, and uh, and I think uh, there's an important distinction here. How do we, you know, as we focus on education, increasingly people are, are struggling with it. We've been studying the problem. Uh, particularly K through 12 for, for a long time. I mean, gathering storm studies and, and things like that. And, and so how do we really measure outcomes, uh, not just activity and effort is, uh, is increasingly a part of that. And I'm not trying to get into, you know, test scores or not, or those types of things, but it's gonna be very, very important because there's a sense of urgency here to fix this as you described, Joan, and, uh, and how do we do it? How do we do it most effectively? What are the things that are proven to actually work and make a difference? Uh, I think uh, is kind of the distinctions we're gonna need to start uh, parsing here because uh, time is of the essence. Funding is not gonna be uh, as available as, uh, as we might wish. You can't do everything. So where do you put that effort to really uh, start making a difference in this? And to be fair, there are lots of efforts out there, but, uh, but I think a lot of it's gonna have to uh, to, uh, to be kind of prioritized based on where we see real change and, uh, and real progress. Can I just make a quick comment on that? So when my, st when my children were in middle school, I had them in what I thought was the best school in this town that I lived in. Um, it was in League City, Texas, near Johnson Space Center. So I thought I had my kids in a great school, and this family moves in from Germany, put their kids in the school for one semester, and then they took them out. And I talked to the mother, and she said, 
the school's too easy compared to where we came from in Germany. Um, they're learning stuff they had already learned, and y'all here at the United States are much farther behind where we are in Germany. I was very, very surprised. Um, but, you know, I'm not saying advocate this, but if, if you go online and look for the, the uh, countries that graduate the most number of engineers, now I know we want quality, not quantity, but by f I would never have guessed. Russia graduates something like uh, some hundreds of thousands, almost twice as much as the United States with a smaller population. Now, again, I, I don't think that numbers tell is certainly is not the whole story you want. You want quality, not quantity. But, you know, maybe one of the answers is mandating math, science, and engineering in high school. And they, they don't do that. So I don't know, maybe y'all can let us know about that because we're in a position, I think, where we can make a recommendation that could affect the whole country. I mean, should, should students, and I believe in education um, being run at, a, at, you know, more the local and state level, but, you know, should the students be required to take math, science, and engineering? They're not. Okay. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Dan Miranda with Northrop Grumman, and I'm going to change topics a little bit from, from the STEM folks that are already interested in aerospace to the vast majority of this country that probably isn't as aware of what we do for a living. Um, I'm at the point in my career where I do a lot of outreach, and I go out and talk to folks. And I'm constantly amazed by how many people don't know what SLS is, don't know that NASA is still working to put people into space. Is the UAG doing something or, or working to address that somehow to, to let the rest of the country know uh, what we do and how important it is to this country? Well, I'm, I'm going to give Eileen a rest here, and I'll, I'll try and leap in. We, we specifically chartered the, the committee and, and the uh, that she chairs uh, the Education Outreach Committee to address that that fact, and uh, and it came about as as in the conversation that many of you have had with neighbors and and friends from school, church, or wherever. Who you know? Why are we doing this? Why are we spending all this money? Why are we investing in uh, in these complex space systems? Even those that are aware sometimes don't understand value and uh, and the like. And that's a conversation that uh, that needs to be held at the, at a, at a national level. We've we've gotten the vaccine. We uh, we've bought in and uh, and believe it's it's important. But not everyone is there. And if we're going to do this as a nation, if we're going to do this as a globe, quite frankly. Frankly, that kind of passion uh, is going to be required, and uh, that kind of commitment. We see it, uh, interestingly enough, when we travel internationally. Uh, it's also out there. Uh, there is a, a renewed interest in, in all of this, but uh, we've got to avoid preaching to the choir. In, uh, in, in wonderful seminars and sessions such as this, we've got to take that message more more broadly. And and I think uh, while most of us remember, uh, no, not most of us in this room, but certainly. Uh, I remember watching, you know, launches in grainy black and white television images and uh, and all of that, and, and just being, uh, you know, palpably excited about it all. Uh, that's not enough. I mean, there's going to have to be a, uh, a, a not a storyline because that implies spin or fiction, and that's not what I'm implying. But there's got to be a really compelling explanation and understanding on the part of uh, of a much broader segment of the population if this is going to continue to have the momentum that we've seen building over the last couple of years. And I invite Mary Lynn to. Any thoughts you've got on that with your interactions? So um, there have been studies done on outreach and the awareness of the public with regard to the space program since the 60s. There's a myth that the American public was solidly behind Apollo. It was not um, until after the moon landing. There's also a myth that the majority of people who are aware of space just don't care. The fact of the matter is that the majority of people are not aware of space. Um, and so what w we know already what the problem is, the problem's been characterized and characterized and characterized. We also know how to do strategic communications. That is, it's a combination of a science and an art. Um, there are public relations firms that get paid rightly millions and millions and millions of dollars to do it. Um, the US government has done campaigns in the past that have been really successful, and I always call on the stop smoking campaign um, as one of the more successful campaigns. Um, the, the thing is that we have never, as a uh, community, undertaken to target the resources that needed to be targeted in such a way as to be able to do that. So what Eileen's trying to do, and I'm not going to speak for her, I'm going to shut up in a minute and give her back her mic, um, but, but what Eileen's trying to do is, is think about all this now 
in this day and age, right? Means for communication is totally different um, than it was. And so how, how do you think meaningfully about how it is that you do outreach and engagement and what should the targets of that, what, what should you want to get out of that? I mean, what is the purpose um, of doing that? So I'll, I'll stop now, sorry. Well, you know, I think, I, I just wanna say that the NAC, the NASA Advisory Council had a discussion on this very topic in I think it was their August meeting, it was August, September, whenever they met, they had a huge discussion on this, and General Lyles, who's the chairman of the NAC, called me and told me about it and said, you know, we need to jump on this again because we had the same discussion at the NAC. Well, it's kind of an ongoing discussion, as you can imagine, um, over the years. So um, we hear you. I mean, NAC or uh, NASA has won awards for social media. Uh, they do a very good job with social media, but. I think it's working for those that are interested. So you're talking about reaching out to people that, you know, I had people telling me, oh, well, ever since NASA shut down, ever since NASA shut down, I go, wait a minute, NASA didn't shut down. <laughs> they think because we're not launching astronauts, NASA shut down. So, you know, it is, it is a problem to reach people that, and these are voters, you know, people that don't know anything about space to begin with. But who's got an idea on how to fix this? How well, can I, do? may I jump in here? Is the moderator allowed to say anything? Absolutely. Uh, uh, I, 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 yeah, like I, you're right. You're not gonna stop me. Uh, <laughs> we, there, there's lots of discussions going on at the top level, uh, like Mary Lynn and Eileen and Jim have all described. Those are all necessary, but I'm also gonna turn the mirror around a little bit on all of us in this room, just like I did yesterday about the workforce development. It's about engagement. Um, when you're sitting on the airplane, and I'm just as guilty, I get, like to get on an airplane, leave me alone, put my headphones in, let me do something, let me read, do some work or whatever. Have a conversation with the person sitting next to you. Ask them, what do they do? Start the conversation, engage. Um, all of us engineers, we don't like doing that. If, if you start to engage and you, start with a smaller community and then you get more people bought in and they start having a conversation you can you, you can have an effect here uh, it and it's not sufficient either but it's necessary that we also engage with this and not just wait for somebody else to go take care of it for us so uh, a little bit of a challenge from from uh, from to all of us including myself because I like to get on an airplane and everybody leave me alone <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm, I'm Jeet Gupta. I'm a faculty member here at UAH. Uh, I have been in the engineering school as well as in the business school now. So I have a pers pers little perspective different than the normal faculty member. Uh, uh, so I want to say three things. One, how do we outreach to the people who may not know about space, may not know about NASA? Entertainment is the best way. I've seen the television programs and the movies and everything that gets the message across. So I think if you want to reach to the people and inform them about what space is about and what NASA is doing, we should work with the entertainment industry and have them produce the shows that people will watch and will be received well. Second, the, my, my point, uh, one, uh, I think one of the things we need to do to STEMS is to add another M at the end. Being in the engineering schools and the management schools, I learned that the people do not know how to manage time, how to manage careers, how to manage themselves, how to manage people around them. And for the STEM people to get into a program like this space, that is a must. So we need to add a M at the end of that and say management also is part of STEMs. The third, I think uh, the dropout things. One of the things we found at UAH is that the biggest cause of the dropout, particularly the undergraduate after the first and the second year, is the financial one. It is not the heavy lifting of the courses or anything like that, it is the financial one. If we can handle the financial aspects, students will stay. And we have found out that after we handle the financial aspect and develop a matrix that we can give the support to the students, our retention rate has gone up. So that may be something that we should be looking at also. So if I may ask a question, how many, to, to your first point, how many people have seen First Man? How many of you have encouraged your friends and neighbors and acquaintances and people you meet on the street to go see First Man? 
good. Keep it up. Because when I heard that it was not doing as well in the box office as The Star is Born, um, I thought it was really a shame, frankly, because that's the kind of thing, to your point, the entertainment industry puts it out there. When they put it out there, let's use it. Any, let's see, who's next? Hi, Megan Geyer from the University of Illinois. I want to go back to um, education in STEM fields for a little bit. Um, I think that there could be a lot more going on in terms of getting high school students involved. Um, the high school that I went to in particular was involved in this one program called Project Lead the Way. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it, but um, we offered like optional engineering classes that allowed the students to do basic uh, computer aid design work, um, design work, basic coding, like doing um, applied physics classes like really early on in high school. I remember um, my brother was doing work. Um, he takes the classes right now, he's in high school, um, where he was literally seeing work that I hadn't seen until my sophomore year of college. And I was like, wow, if I'd seen classes like that early on, like maybe I would have been a little bit better prepared going in. Um, so I think that not having those classes be like optional, but having them be like actually required in a high school setting would be really beneficial. Uh, can I ask a oops, can I ask a quick question of the students that are here, since you're all engaged in this in some way or another? How many of you feel that you were inadequately prepared by high school? Okay, thank you. It's interesting. Uh, Daniel Burns from the Marshall Space Flight Center. I want to I want to tack on to that that idea of being inadequately prepared. Um, I think what Alexander said earlier that uh, it you know, the, the 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 classes in in college are more difficult and they're supposed to be and that the uh, it's the fact that the kids are not getting the kind of training and education in high school that that's an issue and, and Colonel Collins asked what is it that the government can be doing to possibly help with that. Um, I think if you look at the, I, I think you'll find if you look in the history that there's a statistical correlation between the decrease in the preparedness of high school students and the funding from the federal government for education. And so maybe the answer is not the government needs, needs to do more. Maybe the answer is the government needs to do less. Hello. Thank you for being here. My name is Suzanne Stone. I'm a current student of UAH. Um, my, my major is finance with a minor in economics, and I have a passion for space. I'd like to see more programs geared towards finance, economics, business majors. I see a lot of internships for engineers and stuff that's offered through the school, but I rarely see anything for business administration, finance, economics, that kind of thing. Thank you. Do you mean, do you mean, you. Do you mean it, engineering it, students it, having those courses, or do you mean a completely separate major? A uh, completely separate major. I'd okay. Like and I, you know, I think she raises a, a great point here, and we, we tend to, as we all do, most of us come from engineering backgrounds and aviation backgrounds and the, and the like, but, uh, you know, much as I don't like the term, it's overused, but, you know, there's an ecosystem that supports the space enterprise, too, and it needs uh, uh, a lot of different dimensions, not all of them in the technical engineering field. You need, to, as we've heard in our earlier conversations, you need contracting expertise. You need, uh, you know, quite frankly, legal expertise, both on the policy side and uh, and in other domains. And so, uh, you can be a hugely productive and important and pivotal part of the space enterprise without necessarily uh, doing the uh, uh, the CAD CAM and the uh, and the and the hardware design. And so, I think that's a that's an important uh, nuance here that we ought to pick up on as well. That uh, and and the broader that enthusiasm spreads the, into other communities and the like, I think. Uh, I mean, you look at any of the major primes or any major company today that's contributing significantly to space, and look at what their organization looks like. And uh, yes, there's a cadre and a core of uh, of dedicated and hardworking engineers, but there's a whole additional groupings of people on the IT side and. Uh, 
the finance side and, and other areas that, that make the enterprise run. Gets back to the professor's uh, uh, comment on management and, uh, and the like, and, uh, and program management is not the same as, uh, as project design and, and the like. And so there's, there's a whole range of skills here that are going to be necessary to, uh, to keep this enterprise going. So thanks for reminding us of that. Uh, Clive Neal, University of Notre Dame. I want to come back to the education. I've been at Notre Dame for longer than I care to remember. Um, and I notice with the incoming students, and this is my pool of uh, information, is they don't know how to study. They've never had to study in high school. To be perfectly blunt, I think high school's too easy. Uh, what I, Eileen said about uh, the, the German family coming over and then extracting their kids, I raised my kids through the school system and I was shocked at the lower standard than what I went through back in England. Um, and to me, when students come in, I met with a freshman uh, just last week. I said, so how's, how's it going the first, uh, first semester at Notre Dame? He says, I've never worked so hard. He says, I, I, I actually have to study now. I said, do you know how to study? Well, I'm learning. So I, I think it's a preparation thing when, when they come through and, and the people who are closer to high school than I am can, can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, my, my interaction with freshmen at Notre Dame is, is that high school needs to prepare them better for college. Um, and whether that be management, whether that be study habits, but there needs to be a rethink in the way that uh, kids are prepared. And right now it's just a conveyor belt. We've got to get them through. That's what I see in the South Bend Community School Corporation. we just got to get them through. And it's, it's an endemic problem that I don't know what the fix is. I can point out the problem. I have no fixes for that, but that's uh, a <laughs> geologist, not an engineer. So I do want to plug science, by the way. Um, but the other thing I would like to bring up to shift gears is uh, resources, especially on the moon and Mars and asteroids. And the, the, the legisl legislative uh, issues that go along with extracting and using those um, is a big question mark in the communities that I interact with about we want to, want to do ISRU. It's, it's going to enable an economy, it's going to do this, that and t'other, um, it's going to create jobs and it's going to make us sustainable as we go out into the solar system. But we need to start thinking about the, the legal uh, issues around using those resources now um, so that it doesn't hold us up as we, we go out and there's a roadblock. So I'll just speak to that real quickly. That's, um, that's kind of in our wheelhouse when we talk about economic development of low Earth orbits, the center space, and the moon. Um, and the question of regulatory reform is certainly one that's been taken on full force by this White House and was addressed or has been addressed for the last several years in Congress, both, both Republican and, and Democrat and both sides, both, both houses, right? Um, but the, the larger question that I think you're pulling on has to do with the uh, international agreements um, that date back in some cases 50 years and were con conceived at a time that nobody was thinking about non-state actors, right? It was, it, was all about, it was all about state actors and nations. And so there's a lot of discussion going on. Right now, the, 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 the um, Congress is sort of taking the position that's like, well, we'll define what it is that we're going to do, which is fine. Um, but we'll get to a point where you can sort of see it coming right down the road. So um, thanks for the comment, because that's one that's real helpful, I think, for us, especially if we're thinking about trying to develop. And right now, it's probably too early to say we're trying to develop this learner economy now, but we need to lay into place the framework that will enable these things to happen. And so I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, Steve Cate and I have had this conversation often. It's, uh, it's yet another example, and it's true in the cyber world as well, uh, you know, but it's certainly true in space where, in a real sense, the technology has outpaced the policy in a lot in a lot of ways, and we're and we're working to catch up uh, across the whole uh, dimension. I mean, what is our policy, that kind of thing, but also how do we think about uh, uh, the economics and the and the competition, and uh, and is the Outer Space Treaty, written in 1967, uh, really? large enough, and if not, what ought to replace it? Uh, as you know well, the Russians and Chinese are out there trying to, to market an alternative view about, uh, about some norms of behavior in space, and, and so uh, we're not quite enamored with, with how they've chosen to approach it, but, you know, so how do we proceed? It's also got to take place in, a, in an international environment where, quite frankly, supranational organizations are, 
not as well regarded as they used to be. So if somebody's going to write those treaties or those agreements, who's going to do that? And uh, and are they going to be supported and endorsed? So, but it's a it's a hugely complex issue. I mean, it's we've got to think more strategically about this. As I, as I used to say in another life. Uh, Tactical energy in a, in a strategic vacuum is a recipe for failure, and so we've got to get some of the, uh, the strategy right. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Legg. I'm from the University of Illinois, and going back to the outreach issue, so um, I guess I have two main points. When it comes to uh, being more prepared in high school, I know that the way that it works in Europe is when you get into your freshman year, you kind of choose a science or an arts track, um, and it kind of more s focuses all of the, uh, like English, if you're taking the science track, would be more technical writing oriented, and you're more focused on the classes that you're gonna take in college. And I know for a lot of freshmen coming in, um, not knowing specifically what you wanna do or having like the ability to try out more technical classes in high school is definitely something that makes them reconsider what major they should be doing. So um, I know that that might be an attributing factor to maybe why they have such a high percentage of graduating engineers. Um, and then my second point um, is that uh, I think another thing to help maybe encourage students not necessarily drop out is to have a community around them that helps encourage them and remind them that they can succeed within engineering. So um, a lot of us from the University of Illinois here are from one specific student group um, that we are all a bunch of rocket nerds. And so we all bond over the fact that like, Obviously, we love space, but also we're here to support each other, right? So we're here to encourage each other in classes, and a lot of students don't have that. Um, and so uh, we do that through technical projects, and NASA is amazing with this because they offer a bunch of student projects um, that are funded by NASA and also give you the opportunity to realize that, hey, maybe I'm not doing so well in chemistry or physics, but I just built this super cool EVA tool, and I'm going to go test it down in the NBL. So like, I don't know, sometimes when students are doubting themselves, it's actually applying um, like your experience to projects that you'll actually use in industry, while a lot of the classes we're not that we're taking are not necessarily industry focused. So I think that um, NASA just needs to keep doing what it's doing with reaching out, because that's a lot of the projects we do are all NASA related, and they're awesome, and a lot of them do incorporate different majors. Um, so I think that that's really important just to keep offering projects like that. Um, so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Great input. Thank you. Uh, good, good morning. Point. My name is Alex Liu. I'm from University of Illinois at Brandon Champaign, and I'm a mechanical engineering major. So about the education side of the in the STEM field, so I'm fortunate to be educated in both the out of the states and in states for both my high school and college. So I just have a comment on that about. Um, a, kind of like our national standards say in the, especially in the STEM field, based upon my high school experience. Cause, um, so I, I was in a, actually a Catholic high school in, in West Philadelphia. So it's kind of interesting to see the differences in, the, in, the, in terms of like the class setup and the co courses offered across the entire country. So my school unfortunately doesn't, um, didn't offer or like a lot of STEM uh, related courses. I finished uh, actually my math and physics, those kind of stuff in my junior year. And then I ended up like taking nothing, like nothing related to STEM in my senior year and coming in as a mechanical engineer major. So there's like huge differences there. And meanwhile, I'm I'm being uh, informed that um, say by my friends from in Boston that um, so they are offering all the way till like differential equations. Say that would be like say uh, probably for me will be my sophomore year in college. So I just say there's a like huge variation there, and it's heavily relate uh, like um, related to the staff members that you uh, that like who's responsible for the education in high school. That um, I was. Uh, fortunately enough to have a uh, former uh, naval officers uh, he was he was in uh, he was teaching me physics a brilliant guy and unfortunately there were only three of us in the class for physics two for some reason and two of them didn't understand a lot so um, th so anyway I just like see there's like a there isn't like a really formal standard that uh, being uh, enforced for say private school public school and Catholic and others so um, I feel like that creates the differences once everyone gets into the college and in uh, like in the same platform, people are competing like with this huge different backgrounds that are 
may create the differences in either the way like people may consider about dropping out because like they see the huge differences with the people that they're competing at on the same platform once you get there. So I feel either that's going to be like a quality of education or it's going to, and it's also related to the dropping out rates like in college. Okay. I just don't know if there's any comments. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Admiral, I want to thank you for mentioning the Gathering Storm paper because uh, for those of us who've been working in this area for, for many years, it does go back decades. And one of the recommendations from that that, that we're all kind of dancing around right now is teacher preparedness and teacher compensation at the, at the high school and, and younger levels. Um, we have great programs here in Huntsville, thanks to corporate sponsorship. We have Project Lead the Way. We have a Green Power Initiative around engineering. We have Cyber Patriot. We have a terrible time getting teachers who are qualified. And if we get teachers that are qualified, we lose them to industry. So making sure that we have the programs in place that compensate teachers and making sure that we are expecting more and preparing the teachers so that we can raise that overall level of academic achievement while we're preparing them specifically for these careers. Great okay, point, Joel. Thank you. I think we have one here in the middle. <clears throat> My name is uh, David Quam, and I work with the National Governors Association, the Conference of State Legislators, counties, mayors. And I think I want to go to your outreach question. How do you get this story out? I am fascinated by all the questions that you're getting with regard to education, workforce, jobs, the future, what the needs are. What you have when you're talking about outreach, and I think for your group in particular, is you have a whole set of ambassadors who have both the policy chops and the authority to help you at the state and local level. So when you're talking about outreach, the governors, the legislators, the mayors, the county officials, all who control some of the policy programs for workforce, do the curriculum for education, have a say over what the resources are at that level, that is critical to your future your future mission and NASA's future mission. So I would start with that outreach, and it just so happens that all those folks, like many of us here, are the children of Apollo. So they remember. They remember the story. And yes, they know that NASA has not been flying for a while, but we've started to tell, and I've been working with, uh, in coordination with Marshall, to start telling the story that you're going back to space, that the world's largest rocket is going to be launched for the United States. And I will, one thing that the Department of Defense did extremely well back in the 1950s is it started to tell its economic impact story for the states. Marshall has adopted that and has a fantastic uh, display of all the subcontractors that are helping to build that rocket. That is 48 states just for the rocket. You throw in Orion and you hit all 50 states. That means when this launches, all 50 states can be part of helping to build, launch, and be part of the launch for America's rocket. That's your arc, as was described before. That's your story. And my sense is working together between the aerospace industry, between some of those groups, not just at the federal level, but doing that outreach with governors, with legislators, with mayors, with counties, that's how you can get this story into a policy realm that actually gets to make change. And I think change is what you're looking for to sustain this. One last story I will say, um, there was an opportunity, a uh, gentleman from Marshall who spoke to a uh, middle school and had one of the greatest lines, it was part of what Von Braun said as well. He looked at the students who were in middle school and said, you know what, I'm not gonna be flying this to Mars, you are. And he brought those 13, 12 and 13 year olds into that discussion. It was inspirational. I've never seen 700 junior high students, junior high school students sit still and not say anything. They did at that moment, and they knew that they could be part of it. So you have a great story to tell. Happy to be part of this and part of this discussion. We'd we'll love to talk more about that outreach. But I think your outreach has got to go beyond the federal, beyond the public, reach to some of the real decision makers who can make a difference. Thanks for that. And just by the way, uh, Governor Kay Ivey is representing the governors on the UAG, so we have someone who has that background and understanding certainly is a part of this uh, this small group okay good morning i would like to add one point that we seem to be missing about how to reach the public in general and that's to let them know everything that they take for granted today 
that was developed by NASA. You know, the technologies we have. It's amazing when I talk to my neighbors, they go, well, what good is NASA? And I start telling them about everything that we take for granted that came about as a result of NASA technology. And I think that's one area that NASA is really delinquent in is, hey, look, all these things that we have developed, you know, I think we could really stress that and it would go a long way to making the public in general go, yeah, NASA's great. Yes, we do need it. So that's just something to think about. And I would like to add on to what Dan said about engaging people, because I was very fortunate about six years ago to meet a young flight attendant on a flight. And she found out I worked for NASA and she was very excited. We've stayed in touch and uh, I think it's this fall she will be graduating with an engineering degree and already has some offer. So engaging people does work and I recommend it to everybody. Great points, thank you. And and it's really, uh, it's even beyond NASA. I mean, some organizations now have uh, hypothesized the, the, the hypothetical day without space, uh, just to remind people of, of what we rely on and the things that we take for granted that uh, many people don't even know are space-based. Uh, you know, some people think the GPS is in your car and, uh, and that's, uh, or your cell phone and, and nowhere else. Uh, I once knew a, a young, uh, uh, military man who says, well, I, you know, asked him about whether we needed the, what he thought of the satellites and the, and the architecture. He said, well, we don't need the satellites, Admiral. Oh, I got my GPS, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, I think we have time for one more. And okay. right here. Hi, um, I'm Harriet Hunt. I'm from the University of Illinois. I'll try to be super quick. But um, I did want to say, like, I'm a freshman, so I've just had my high school experience and now I'm adjusting to being in my undergraduate studies. Um, and I have seen that I was lucky to take my programming classes, research and design classes, like engineering type courses in my high school. And I think that they have like extensively prepared me. Um, but I have seen that the hardest part for me at least has been adjusting to like the time management as a professor said, um, like the difference between the way calculus is taught in college versus high school. And then I've also seen the discrepancy between American education and international education because my family is Australian. And so when I talk to my cousins who go to school in Australia, you know, they say, well, I learned that in physics, you know, like in 10th grade, um, like responding to things that I'm learning now. And then um, recently my cousin actually is 13 and she was able to, her school requires them to do like an apprenticeship. And so she got to kind of shadow an engineer and then she came back from that saying, well, I want to do engineering. So I think that that like early exposure to seeing what you can potentially do in your career helps a lot. Um. Oh, thank you. You want one more? Oh, yeah, I've got one more up here. Dan. Okay. Hi, I'm Jan C. McPhee from the Aerospace Corporation, and I am also a neuroscientist by training. So this is going to echo a lot of the things said, I think that we have to dutifully train the facts and the analytical processes, but we can also consciously train some of these holistic skills like the ability to study and the ability to be creative and think differently, the ability to communicate, the ability to work together co collaboratively as teams. And I've seen different middle schools, different high schools, different universities take a more conscientious role in actually purposely training those things, and th that's a recipe to success. The other thing I wanted to say was to echo the comment about outreach and entertainment, but to expand upon that, I think that we can enlist the public to help us in telling our story about the future of space exploration by encouraging them to, motiv to motivate them to actually learn what we're doing and create materials that can help, help tell the story on the internet and in through the media and through conversations. And I, I say that because I'm also the executive director of a nonprofit and we do exactly that and we, we generate materials and that material then becomes useful for telling the story. And there's an incredible sense of ownership and investment in that future that results and a huge community starts to be developed. So yes, I know we, we all get a little bit antsy sometimes about including the public, but there are ways to manage that and actually do that effectively. 
And I'd just like to put a plug in for Yancey's recent work along with Lockheed Martin, Cinelan, AIA, um, uh, NASA, there was a art project um, basically called Project Mars that some of you may have heard, on, heard of that went on for months um, and solicited art pieces and film. And they recently announced the winners and Twitter has been lit up um, with this and it showed up in a whole lot of other places in social media. So it's a great indication of a, a great example of a project that was limited in scope, um, but it's had a tremendous amount of outreach. So. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Jim, Eileen, and Mary Lynn for for participating, and also for you uh, in participating in this discussion uh, and and providing the input. So uh, let's give everybody a round of applause, particularly. 